And this is the Translational Research in Clinical Oncology course. We've been doing this for about 15 years now. And my name is Terry Moody. I'm with the National Cancer Institute. And so the best way to get me is through email, moodyt at mail.nih.gov. So we have an organizing committee for this class. One of the people on the committee is Erwin Arias. He's in charge of demystifying medicine, which is, has a format similar to this, but demystifying medicine, it focuses on all diseases, whereas we just focus on cancer. So also we have Lubya Vodakoski and Farah Zia on the organizing committee. And my job boss is Jonathan Wiest. And he pays for all the video cats. So we want to be nice to him. So usually uh, the class is at 4 o'clock on Mondays. But we can't always get this room on that particular date. But just yesterday was a holiday. So we're having the lecture on Tuesday today. And then next week, we go back to uh, Monday at 4 to 6. And the class is videocast at the NIH, videocast.nih.gov. So it's being videocast live now. And also, after two days, it's then archived. So you can call it up anytime on your computer if you miss the class or you want to see it again. Uh, two days after the lecture, and it's present on YouTube on the NIH site. So next week, <clears throat> we have a lecture on clinical trials, as well as precision medicine. And basically at NIH, what they do in the clinic now for the cancer patients is they do a molecular analysis of the tumor when the patient comes in, and they put the patient on the clinical trial and treat them with various drugs. Based on the genomic profile of the patient, that dictates what the therapy is. And then when the trial is complete, they analyze the tumor again for the genetic profile to see if it's changed. And sometimes it does. Cancer, it's a moving target. So we have an initial disease, and the disease may respond to a particular therapy. But then during the therapy, the cancer can mutate further and then become resistant to the therapy. So then you have to find an alternative therapy. Keeps us busy. OK, and we see on September 18th, we don't have a lecture because we couldn't get the room. But then on September 25th, we have immune checkpoint inhibitors and ovarian cancer again Monday afternoon. And uh, one sort of rapidly developing therapy is using antibodies to ligands such as PD-1. And many of the cancers are resistant to immune response. The immune system won't recognize the cancer as foreign. And when you treat the cancer with antibodies to PD-1, then the cancer is exposed and uh, the immune system can respond to it. And Stephanie Goff, she was one of the key clinicians on the uh, uh, Discovery Channel recently. They presented a series of lectures on uh, first response of immune patients. And uh, she featured a patient who had melanoma and who was treated with the immune checkpoint inhibitors. So then in October, we focus on other types of cancers, such as prostate cancer. And then uh, October 9th is a holiday, the Columbus Day. So we go back to Tuesday, October 10th. And we talk about common types of therapy for uh, cancer. That's radiation oncology. Some cancers respond to that quite well. And then there's also chemotherapeutic agents, such as topoisomerase inhibitors are used often in chemotherapy. And then October 17th, again, that's a Tuesday. And one of the people is lecturing on small molecules. And my specialty is actually lung cancer. And one of the key mutations in non-small cell lung cancer is the EGF receptor, a receptor tyrosine kinase. 
And when this gets mutated, you can then treat it with tyrosine kinase inhibitors. And these are small molecules then that block the enzymatic activity of the receptor tyrosine kinases. So small molecule inhibitors are very much in the vogue especially for inhibiting uh, tyrosine kinases, as well as other types of kinases. And then October 23rd, we go back to a Monday and talk about breast cancer. So the four big killers in cancer are breast cancer, lung cancer, prostate cancer, and colon cancer. And then on October 30th, we have a lecture on cancer health disparities. So oftentimes minorities, such as African-Americans, have a much more difficult time responding to cancer therapies, especially in breast cancer. Many of the women have triple negative breast cancer, and it's very difficult to find a therapy for that. And then November 6th, it's a Monday again. We have John Schiller lecturing about cervical cancer. And about one third of the cancer therapies that are commonly used were developed here at NIH. You start in the uh, basic lab and John found that L1 virus-like particles produce a very good immune response against cervical cancer. And subsequently that's become a cervical cancer vaccine. And the drug Gardasil is used now in teenage girls about a third of the girls in this country get uh, vaccinated with Gardasil, and that makes them resistant to getting the virus for cervical cancer. And then we go back to a Tuesday, November 14th. Uh, Eva Zabel will be talking about the non-small cell lung cancer. And November 20th, we finally close out on the Mondays. We again talk about genomics and HIV. November 27th, there's a lecture on epigenetics, about all cancers caused by mutations in the genome. Sometimes things just get shut off, such as tumor suppressor genes. And we close on a lecture on pancreatic cancer, as well as nanotechnology. So basically we go for 13 weeks, and um, we have a website where you can find the lectures. What we try to do is post the PowerPoints, but to do that, we have to make them 508 compliant, and that takes a bit of time. So most of the lectures will be posted ultimately on the website. Um, and the website is also where the final exam will be. For those of you who want to get a certificate, uh, basically there's a computer graded final examination after the class ends. And then another unique feature of the TRACO is in December we arrange so that you can visit uh, core facilities. NCI has lots of core facilities, such as there's one in pathology that we routinely visit. And then alternatively, you can visit uh, tumor boards where the cases are discussed for individual patients that are being treated on clinical protocols. So that makes it different from an academic course. Uh, we also allow you to see our core facilities and our uh, tumor boards. So are there any questions on the organization of the course? Okay, if not, then we'll proceed and discuss the first lecture. And so we mentioned before, the big four killers in the US are lung cancer, colon cancer, breast cancer, and prostate cancer. These combined constitute about a half of all of the cancer cases in the US. We see there's a little over a million cases a year. And about half of these people will ultimately die from the cancer. But we see some types of cancers have a very good therapeutic outcome. Breast cancer, we have many, many drugs that we can use to treat it. So as a result, only uh, about 20% uh, of the patients that get breast cancer will ultimately die from it. So that's very good news. 
prostate cancer also, we have uh, lots of drugs for it, but basically prostate cancer grows very slowly. And a lot of men that are diagnosed with prostate cancer, ultimately they'll die from other things such as heart disease and not prostate cancer. If the prostate cancer is growing very slow, the clinician does nothing because the patient doesn't really need drugs. And we see with colon cancer, again, we have a pretty good response rate, but about 30% uh, will die from it. And colon cancer, basically it's genetic. So uh, about 30% of the cases in colon cancer are genetic. And it's very difficult to treat these. Whereas in breast cancer, maybe about 10% of the cases are genetic. Prostate cancer, even less. And lung cancer, there's virtually no cases that are genetic. All the cases of lung cancer, most of them come from smoking cigarettes. And we see the mortality rate is very high, on the order of 90%. So lung cancer, we still have a very long ways to go, but these immune checkpoint inhibitors are now starting to show some promise in lung cancer. And about 20% of the patients are now responding to these immune checkpoint inhibitors. So in the last decade, we've got the tyrosine kinase inhibitors that respond to patients that have EGF receptor mutations. And now we have the immune checkpoint inhibitors and some of the patients respond to that. And even if you only have 10% of the patients responding, you're saving 17,000 lives a year. And with the immune checkpoint inhibitors, we're getting about a 20% response rate. So you're saving about 30,000 lives a year, and that's a big number. So with lung cancer overall, we have a little over half a million dying each year. But we see that lung cancer is accounting for a lot of these deaths. So right now, we sort of leveled off in terms of deaths, and that's because we're getting much better at treating breast cancer and prostate cancer and colon cancer. But the only way we're going to go down in these deaths is if we get something that's really effective for lung cancer. So I started working on lung cancer about 30 years ago. I knew it was a lifetime challenge. And it's still going to be a challenge for all of you who want to work in the field. There's still a long ways to go. OK, so that's the big four. And those are the big killers in the US. We have other types of cancers that kill 10 to 30,000 annually, such as pancreatic cancer. And pancreatic cancer, glioblastoma, brain cancer, ovarian cancer, and lung cancer. Very difficult to treat. Almost everyone who gets that uh, is likely going to die from it. Other types of cancer, such as leukemia, we have fairly good treatment for that now. Stomach cancer, it's not a big problem in the uh, US, but in Asia, stomach cancer is a big problem, and it's because of the food that the people are eating. Usually the food is poorly prepared and oftentimes it's smoked and cured in salt and this leads to many cases of stomach cancer in Asia. We mentioned ovarian cancer is very difficult to treat as is brain cancer. Liver cancer, it can come from organic solvents such as I'm a chemist and work in the lab and solvents like chloroform just destroy your liver. So you're always supposed to wear gloves and never let chloroform touch your skin. But also liver cancer can be caused from cirrhosis of the liver if you drink too much alcohol. And then another type of cancer is esophageal cancer. Again, this is associated with uh, the smoke of the cigarettes. So, cancer risks. Alcohol, we mentioned. If you have too much alcohol, that can lead to liver cancer. Asbestos. In old buildings uh, for insulation, they used 
uh, materials that had asbestos in them. As long as the asbestos stays in the wall, you're fine. But if people start doing construction and ripping up that wall, you better get out of that room. And just to show you, when I was a uh, undergraduate student, I used to work in a chemical lab. And this chemical lab, they made filter pads made of asbestos. And all the workers down there, they would just work and I went down there once and I wore a mask and they all started making fun of me. <laughs> what are you afraid of? And I said, it's asbestos. You're gonna get mesothelioma of the lung if you keep breathing it all the time. And uh, you just have to be aware of your environment. Diet, we mentioned that in Asia, they eat food that's poorly prepared and this can lead to stomach cancer. There's also genetic components. We mentioned colon cancer. About 30% of the cases come from genetic abnormalities. And so with colon cancer especially, they keep a parental tree. Do your parents have colon cancer? Then you're at high risk of getting colon cancer. And hormones. Breast cancer, we have estradiol. About 50% of the patients, uh, estradiol will stimulate the breast cancer growth. In prostate cancer, it's androgens. Obesity increases the risk of colon cancer. In our society in general, we're becoming more and more obese. So you have to watch your diet. Ionic radiation, such as the atomic bomb. When the atomic bomb was dropped on Japan at the end of World War II, the patients initially got leukemia and they died. And the ones that didn't get leukemia, a lot of them 10 years later, they started getting breast cancer and they died. Tobacco, we mentioned, 80% of the lung cancer cases result because the people smoke cigarettes. UV radiation in Florida and especially Arizona, the sun appears to be getting stronger and stronger because we're depleting the ozone in the environment. So more UV rays go through and uh, you have to protect your skin with sunscreen or else you can get melanoma. And then viruses, we mentioned the uh, cervical cancer. It's a viral component. So my specialty is lung cancer and with lung cancer, over 150,000 people get it annually and there's 45 million current smokers, but the good news is there's 45 million ex-smokers. And so uh, when you stop smoking, your risk of lung cancer slowly goes down. It takes about 10 years to get back down to normal risk. Uh, whereas if you stop smoking with heart disease, there's almost immediate benefit. And then it's very difficult to quit smoking due to the nicotine addiction. But now we have uh, drugs for that, such as Chantix and other things. And so in the US, we've made good progress at reducing smoking. So uh, there's lots of chemicals in the cigarette smoke that can form and carcinogens. And we're going to focus on the polyaromatic hydrocarbons. But also there's nicotine metabolites such as NNK. Ethyl carbamate is actually varnish that you use on floors. And then in water, you can get various elements such as nickel, chromium, cadmium, if your water is not pure, and that can lead to cancer. And hydrazine is actually rocket fuel. So uh, what happens with the polyadromatic hydrocarbons is they get oxidized. And then when they get oxidized enough, they can bind to the DNA and cause mutations. And we see that CG can go to form TA mutations in certain genes, especially the genes for P53 and KRETs. So P53 is a tumor suppressor gene. When it gets mutated, it becomes inactive. And KRAS, when it gets activated, it's an oncogene. 
and then uh, it stimulates cancer growth. So benzapyrene, chemically, it's a hydrocarbon with a series of five six-membered rings. We see here that there's hydroxyls, and these can get oxidized, ultimately leading to carcinogens. And so we have benzapyrene and the P450 enzymes start to oxidize it, first to a 7,8 oxide, then to a 7,8 diol, and then we get the ultimate carcinogen, BPDE, which then binds to the DNA, especially the guanines, and forms adducts with the DNA, ultimately leading to mutations. So the P450 enzymes then, they catalyze the addition of oxygen, so it can form the carcinogens, but then ultimately the carcinogens, when they get further oxygenated, they're in a highly soluble inactive form, and they can then be excreted. So you breathe in the cigarette smoke, it forms the carcinogen, and then ultimately you can excrete the carcinogen. And DNA addicts form, as well as interstrand DNA crosslinks. And these can be removed by enzymes, repair enzymes. But the basic problem is if the rate of carcinogen activation exceeds the rate of carcinogen excretion, then you get DNA mutation. And so P53, a tumor suppressor gene, gets mutated. And P53, it's increased after initial DNA damage along with P21, a inhibitor of cell cycle enzymes. And then when P53 gets phosphorylated, it induces the expression of BACs, which causes apoptosis of the cancer cells, GAD45, which participates in DNA repair, and thrombospondin, which inhibits angiogenesis. So P53 tries to stop the cancer cell formation in various ways, such as killing the cell, repairing the DNA damage, and stopping angiogenesis. But when it gets mutated, then it can't do these things to stop the cancer cell from growing. So then the cancer cell grows, and in particular, we see mutations G to T transversions occurring at specific areas in the P53 gene, exon 5, exon 7, and exon 8. And so here we see in terms of mutations, we see it's at codons 157, 58, codons 245, 48, 49, and codon 273. So the mutations then occur at specific areas. It's not just random. So P53 tries to stop the cell cycle going from G1, the resting phase, to the S phase where DNA is replicated. So for the cancer cells to grow, they have to replicate the mutated DNA. And then in the G2 phase, there's further protein synthesis, which supports then the M phase where the chromosomes get segregated and daughter cells form from the parent cell. So initially we have one cell and then we have two cells after we go through one cell cycle. What happens with cancer cells is almost none of the cells are in this G0 phase where they rest. They just grow as fast as they can. So when DNA gets damaged then, P21 gets increased, uh, and P53 tries to drive programmed cell death or apoptosis after DNA damage. But if the P53 gets mutated, it's not able to do that. So then we have to look at the cell cycle enzymes, and we see that in the G1 phase, cyclin D1 is 
very active, and it forms a partner then with the cyclin-dependent kinase, four and six. And then it leads to the S phase, and the S phase, a different cyclin is important, cyclin A, but we still have, now we have cyclin-dependent kinase two, that's the partner for the cyclin A. And then in the G2 phase, we still have cyclin A, but the partner has changed to cyclin-dependent kinase one, and then in the M phase, we have cyclin-dependent kinase one, but now it's partnering with cyclin B. So we see that the cyclins change as the cycles go on, and so do the cyclin-dependent kinases. But they're inhibited, this whole process, by P21, 27, 57, 15, 16, 18, and 19. So basically with lung cancer then, we have tobacco smoke, and it's a very long process. After 10 years of smoking, the normal lung will start to form what's called undergo hyperplasia and metaplasia. After 15 years, dysplasia will form. After 20 years, a small carcinoma in situ will form. And then after 25 years, the malignant cancer will form and it can spread through the body. And so for lung cancer, it starts in the lung and then it can spread to the uh, liver, bone, lymph nodes, and then ultimately the brain. And when it gets into the brain, the patient just has a few weeks left to live. So here we see the normal lung cells in a cartoon. There's a layer of several epithelial cells. With hyperplasia, the number of cells increases. With dysplasia, the cells start to get disorganized. With a carcinoma, it starts to form now. We're starting to get some cancer cells forming. And then ultimately, the dark green malignant cells form. And these can undergo what's called epithelial to mesenchymal transition and go from the lung to other organs. So here's a uh, what's called an H&E stain of the normal lung. And we see on the cell surface, there's a few epithelial cells. The nucleus is shown in blue. The cytosol is shown in pink. We see that there's these villi on the surface of the epithelial cells, and they exchange gases. You breathe in O2, you exhale CO2. And then we see with hyperplasia, the number of cells has increased dramatically, but we still have the villi to exchange the gases. In dysplasia, now the epithelial cells are starting to become disorganized. There's still some villi, so you can exchange gases. And then we get an adenoma. This is a benign tumor, but there's not as many villi. So when you get lung cancer, ultimately you're going to have trouble breathing. And then you get an adenocarcinoma, a malignant group of cells. And these actually will start excreting fluids, such as mucus. And ultimately they can become malignant and go to other organs. So here's a cartoon showing the normal lung in white. And then we get a few cancer cells initially. And then there's tumor promoters, such as growth factors that will stimulate the growth of the initiated cells. And then progression occurs. There's more and more mutations. And then a malignant cancer forms that can undergo metastasis. So with lung cancer, it's thought that at the order of 50 different genes are mutated during this 30-year period. And P53 is one of the key ones that's mutated. And when it gets mutated, it's a tumor suppressor gene. So then the cancer cells are able to grow more rapidly. The P53 can't stop them. And so initially, we have a carcinoma, such as the lung. And when the tumor gets big, on the order of 5 to 10 millimeters, 
it has trouble getting oxygen in the center of the tumor. So what happens is the host blood vessels will then grow in and provide oxygen and nutrients to the tumor, and then the tumor will further grow and ultimately undergo metastasis. So genetic abnormalities in lung cancer, we mentioned P53, a tumor suppressor gene, gets mutated and turned off. Several genes get silenced by epigenetic phenomena, such as P16 and the retinoblastoma gene. And then other oncogenes get amplified, such as cyclin D1. We saw that was an important enzyme in the cell cycle, stimulating uh, G1 to S transitions. CMYK is a nuclear oncogene, and we're going to take a good look at the EGF receptor, which is amplified and mutated in lung cancer. And the herb B2 is one of its partners. It's also uh, amplified and mutated, but not as much as the EGF receptor. So this is a cartoon showing what the tyrosine kinase receptors look like. We've got the EGF receptor, which has domain one and three, they bind EGF. Domains two and four are more structural in nature. And then we see it crosses the plasma membrane once, it binds to ligand on the outside of the cell, the extracellular space. And then it turns on the enzyme on the inside of the cell, the tyrosine kinase domain. And it can phosphorylate various proteins. And we're going to focus on the EGF receptor, but we see there's other families of receptor tyrosine kinases, such as the IGF-1 receptor, the NGF receptor, the PDGF receptor, the FGF receptor, the VEGF receptor. This plays a role in angiogenesis, and the F receptor. And here's a little cartoon showing the uh, EGF receptor family. And so we have the EGF receptor, and there's lots of ligands for it. We especially look at EGF and CGF alpha, transforming growth factor alpha. And then there's the ERB2 receptor. And surprisingly, this has a tyrosine kinase activity, but it's got no ligand. But how do we turn it on? Well, the receptors dimerize. In the EGF receptor, it can form a homodimer, where there's two EGF receptors, or it can form a heterodimer, where there's one EGF receptor and one HER2. And then other members of the family include ERB3 and ERB4. And so the EGF receptor, it's fairly large, 1,186 amino acids. The extracellular 621 amino acids, this is where EGF binds. There's 24 amino acid transmembrane domain, and then 541 amino acids on the intracellular side that has tyrosine kinase activity. And in particular, there's a lysine at 721 that binds ATP, it holds onto the phosphate, and then it transfers it to tyrosine amino acids on protein substrates. And so one of the ways in which the EGF receptor turns itself off after it's activated the substrate is that tyrosine phosphorylates itself. And so uh, real good ligands are EGF as well as transforming growth factor alpha. And one of the labs here at NCI, they actually make EGF alpha pseudomonas exotoxin conjugates. And so these conjugates are able to bind with high affinity to the EGF receptor. But then when the TGF alpha PE38 gets internalized, the PE38 will then kill the cancer cells. So this is one uh, therapy that NCI is pursuing. And this is just an experiment done in the lab, and we see that Here's the EGF receptor getting tyrosine phosphorylated. But other things that get phos tyrosine phosphorylated are phospholipase C, right here, and the phosphatidylinositol 3 kinase, right there. 
And so the EGF receptor, then it can get mutated. And especially when we have this L858R mutation, which is quite common, then it's sensitive to these tyrosine kinase inhibitors, gefitinib and erlotinib. And so we see then that these mutations are in the tyrosine kinase domain of the EGF receptors. Here's the L858R. And then once the uh, EGF receptor tyrosine kinase gets turned on, it can especially go through the MAP kinase pathway to stimulate growth and the AKT pathway to stimulate cancer cell survival. So this shows the growth pathway and we have several players here, the EGF receptor, and it interacts with these adapter proteins, GREB2 and SOS. But then this RAS gets phosphorylated by GTP. RAF gets phosphorylated, it's a serine threonine kinase. MEK gets phosphorylated, it's a uh, enzyme that causes phosphorylation then of the ERK12 and ERK12 can then go into the nucleus and stimulate growth. So we see that the KRAS gets mutated in about 20 to 30 percent of the lung cancer patients and we really have no therapy for it at this point. So the RAS as we mentioned goes through GTP and it gets mutated, especially at codon 12. And up in Frederick, we have a, a group that's trying to work with RAS as a modulator target and come up with new therapies. And the RAF is downstream. RAF especially gets mutated in melanoma. And so they've come up with this tyrosine kinase inhibitor, PLX4032, that's highly responsive in patients with metastatic melanoma. The only problem is with these tyrosine kinase inhibitors is they work about a year or two, and then the cancer mutates into something else, and they become resistant to these drugs. So cancer, it's a moving target. That's the problem. And RAF can then phosphorylate MEK, and MEK1 and, one, MEK one and MEK2, we have inhibitors. And so they're trying this tyrosine kinase trimetinib as a uh, inhibitor in various patients. And another one is selumetinib, again, a tyrosine kinase inhibitor. And we mentioned ERK, phosphorylated ERK goes into the nucleus. Well, it regulates the expression of various uh, nuclear oncogenes, such as FOS, June, and MYC. So this is a very important pathway for growth. And here's a little cartoon showing the EGF receptor forming a dimer. And then it affects RAS, RAF, MEC, ERK, and the ERK goes into the nucleus. And when we do experiments in the lab, it takes 30 seconds for this pathway to occur. It's very rapid, extremely rapid. And this is a cartoon just showing the EGF receptor. Here's a monomer, but then it forms a dimer. And when you add EGF, it becomes an active dimer. And uh, basically we have domains two from one uh, receiver and one partner interacting to form the active dimer. And then it crosses the membrane and turns on the kinase domain to phosphorylate protein substrates. And then the other big thing for the EGF receptor is the survival pathway. And PI3 kinase gets stimulated by ERK. We saw that it was phosphorylated. And then the PI3 kinase can interact with AKT and mTOR to increase cellular survival. And what it does is uh, it increases the anti-apoptotic protein BCL2. So the PI3 kinase, it's got a catalytic subunit that metabolizes PIP2 to 
TIP3. And it's mutated in some of the breast cancers, glioblastoma, colon cancer, and stomach cancer, but not so much lung cancer. So when it gets mutated, then there's more PIP3 to stimulate cellular survival. And the P10 inhibits the enzymatic activity of the PI3 kinase. And it's a physiological antagonist. But unfortunately, P10 gets mutated in about 13% of the breast cancer patients. So then the PI3 kinase, PIP3, its removal from the cytosol is impaired. And the AKT prevents apoptosis of cells, and in particular, a serine 473 gets phosphorylated. And um, it then phosphorylates BAD and caspase 9, preventing the apoptosis of cancer cells. And AKT is again mutated in about 5% of the breast cancer. And mTOR, uh, it's a downstream from the uh, AKT. And people have tried to develop a lot of drugs for treating cancer patients using mTOR. And that's largely been unsuccessful, unfortunately. So this is a cartoon then, just showing lung cancer, what the molecular markers are. And we see about 30% have KRAS mutations. We have no therapy for that at present. About 15 to 20% have EGF receptor mutations. We now have tyrosine kinase activity, tyrosine kinase inhibitors for that. Elk gets mutated in about 5% of the patients. We have tyrosine kinase inhibitors for that. And HER2, just a small percentage, get phosphor, get mutations. Um, but it's an area that we're investigating because the HER2 can form heterodimers with the EGF receptor. And then there's other things such as uh, RET and MET. And you see lung cancer, it's very complicated, but when we add it all up, we see we figured out about 70% of the key driver mutations that occur in lung cancer, but we still got a ways to go. There's 30% more that we don't know yet. So there's still a lot of work to be done on lung cancer. And this is a clinical example of a protocol that NCI has going for lung cancer. So you do the biopsy and you do a genetic analysis. And if you see EGF receptor mutations, you treat the first patient with erlotinib, a EGF receptor tyrosine kinase inhibitor. If you don't see EGF receptor mutations, you look for RAS, RAF, or MEK mutations. If you see that, you treat them with a MEK inhibitor, AZD6244. If you don't see that, you then look for P10 mutations, PI3 kinase mutations, AKT mutations. If you see that, you treat with a PI3 kinase inhibitor, MK2206. If you don't see that, you look for herb B mutations. If you see that, you treat the patient with erlotinib. If you don't see that, you look for KIT mutations, PDGF receptor A mutations. If you see that, you treat them with sunitinib, a tyrosine kinase inhibitor. If you don't see that, <laughs> well, you run out of options sooner or later. But then in the end, when you're all done with the treatment, you again diagnose the tumor because we mentioned that there's this, uh, uh, the tumor can undergo further mutations and become unresponsive to the drug it initially responded to. So you see how the molecular analysis then dictates the therapy of the patient. And this is just a cartoon sort of illustrating that not only does the EGF receptor get activated, but downstream, upstream targets, such as G-protein coupled receptors, can ultimately also activate the EGF receptor. So this is why it's so important in lung cancer. 
So we mentioned that there's resistance and oftentimes it's due to a secondary mutation in the EGF receptor to T790M. And when this mutation occurs, then the patient is no longer responsive to erlotinib or gefitinib. So another disease uh, that occurs in uh, CML patients, leukemia patients, uh, is what happens when there's a translocation from chromosome 22 and chromosome 9. And then what happens is this fused BCR able gene forms and this stimulates tyrosine kinase activity. So they've come up with a tyrosine kinase inhibitor that works against that, and that's Gleevec. So we see we have chromosome 22 and chromosome 9, and there's a breakpoint, a translocation, and then we have a fused bcr able gene, and then this is expressed in the cancer cell, stimulating growth. And so here we see we have chromosome 9 and chromosome 22, and there's a translocation, and the bcr able gene is on chromosome 22 then, and the gene apparently becomes smaller, whereas chromosome 9 actually appears to become larger. And here you see chromosome 9 after the translocation, it's larger. Chromosome 22 after the translocation, it's actually smaller. And so with these drugs, you always want to improve the therapeutic response and minimize toxicity. And with these tyrosine kinase inhibitors, oftentimes there's a, a skin rash and sometimes there's nausea. So you try to use the lowest dose possible to cause a therapeutic response and minimal toxicity. And so after a year, uh, they had 54 patients, 53 out of 54 responded. And after five years, 89% was still uh, responsive. And we see when you have the Gleevec, it blocks the ATP from getting in and donating the phosphate then to a tyrosine on a substrate. And Gleevec gets a small molecule. So after five years, some of the patients became resistant and there were additional mutations in the bcr able gene. So what the researchers then do is they just try to develop a second generation of tyrosine kinase inhibitors. So this is the way cancer is. The human comes up with a therapy, the cancer comes up with something else, then the human has to go back and try to come up with new drugs. So for CML, the tyrosine kinase inhibitors are imatinib, and now they're testing dosatinib. For breast cancer, we have a tyrosine kinase inhibitor, lapatinib, but also we have a monoclonal antibody, Herceptin. For melanoma, we have a tyrosine kinase inhibitor, PLX4032. For gastrointestinal stromal tumors, the target is a receptor tyrosine kinase C kit. We have a matinib working on that. And then the secondary one is sunitinib. And for the EGF receptor, the phase one were gefitinib or allotinib. And now there's phase two drugs for that. So how can we prevent cancer? I have a little list here. And the first thing you want to do is check your house for radon. An example. I used to live in Frederick County on a hill. And then I went to sell the house and move into Montgomery County. And when I went to sell the house, they said, you've got too much radon in your basement. If you lived down in the ba that basement, it would have been the equivalent of smoking three packs of cigarettes a day. Well, we lived upstairs, but they said, so to sell the house, you've got to put in a pump and the pump will blow out the bad air in the basement, 
and then good air will come in and the radon will go down. And so most of the houses here in Maryland have radon pumps now, if you have a basement. Second thing, check your house for asbestos. We mentioned the old houses and the walls. The insulation have, has a lot of asbestos in it. Take precautions at your workplace. Well, many of the buildings here at NIH are very old, such as I used to have an office in building 31, and there was a little sign on it, warning, these walls contain asbestos. So the modern buildings here, uh, they're asbestos free, but still a lot of the old buildings at NIH have asbestos in them. Check your community water system. We mentioned that if there's certain metals such as chromium, this can lead to lung cancer. And so uh, you want to have good air in your house. You want to avoid breeding polluted air such as I used to live in Los Angeles, where there's tremendous amounts of ozone in the air. And I was told, I went to graduate school there for five years. They said, well, every year you live here, you're losing half a year of your natural lifespan because the air is so bad. And I went to school at Caltech, and every day around 1 o'clock, my lungs would start burning because the air, the ozone from downtown, then passed through Pasadena, but by five o'clock it was gone, it had gone down to Riverside, and they were breathing the bad air. Okay, and uh, protect your skin. We mentioned if you go out in the sun, use lots of sunscreen. Don't breathe smoke, such as if you're around a smoker, the secondary smoke isn't good for you. Exercise daily. My big thing is riding bicycles. And this weekend we have the Civil War century. You ride for 100 miles through the battlefields of uh, Gettysburg and Antietam. Avoid pesticides. Certain pesticides are implicated in prostate cancer. Eat lots of fruits and vegetables. These contain reductants. They prevent the generation of carcinogens. Reduce red meat consumption, especially it has lots of fat. Eat fish that are enriched in omega-3 fatty acids. Minimize fried foods. If you go to the restaurant, you have a choice. Do you want your seafood broiled or fried? I choose broiled. Drink alcohol in moderation. You don't want to get liver cancer. Avoid unnecessary x-rays and reduce infections. It's found that about 20% of the cancers come from constant inflammation. So infections sort of start the inflammation and then it continues. And we have a couple of references here uh, about hallmarks of cancer and especially the BCR ABLE pathway. And that's about it for me, so I'd be happy to answer any questions if you have them. If not, we'll move on to Pete. Okay, so Pete Choike, he uh, is an MD from Jefferson Medical College. He did his diagnostic radiology residency at Yale New Haven Hospital. Then he did an imaging fellowship at the University of Pennsylvania. He joined the faculty at Georgetown. And in 2004, we were smart enough to recruit him here to NCI. We had the imaging section, and his title is Imaging of Cancer. Pete. Oh, got to give you the microphone. <laughs> Not going to do me any good. Great. Well, Terry, we're on the exact same cycle we were on last year, because you were going to do that Civil War thing last year. Yeah, so this is like a regular thing. I'm going to be sitting around, but uh, you enjoy yourself. <laughs> um, so 
I'm a biker, but I'm not a century. Gosh, that's that's crazy. <laughs> so, Pete Choiki, I'm a radiologist um, in the NCI, and um, what? Since this is an introductory course or, or class, basically, um, thought what I would do is take you around virtually a radiology department and. Um, sort of go into what makes each of these scanners uh, what they are. And sort of, uh, you have to understand that many radiologists are kind of closet geeks, and we love the equipment and the physics and things like that. So I won't, no equations, guarantee that, but uh, we'll, we will talk about how these things work. So clearly, you know, imaging is a very important aspect of cancer. There are screening techniques that actually look for cancer. Then there are um, staging techniques where the cancer is either known or suspected and you want to see the extent of it. And then once the patient starts treatment, we want to see whether the lesion is decreasing. Uh, so we monitor the patient and after the lesion disappears, hopefully, uh, we check for recurrence. So there's sort of a screening on the post-treatment side has it come back, and ultimately, altogether, the imaging portfolio of a patient determines his or her prognosis, what will happen to the patient. So in the modern uh, imaging department, there are a number of uh, types of scans that you'll encounter, the CT, MRI, ultrasound, SPECT, and PET. Optical imaging is, is one that might be there in the future, but uh, for now, that's not what uh, what we're going to talk about. So uh, the quiz is named that scanner, and I have to tell you that I don't even know the answer to uh, all of this, because many of these scanners look exactly the same. Um, they have a bed for the patient. There's a donut hole where the scanning apparatus is, and then uh, inside the ring is some kind of imaging. So this, uh, for instance, could be a CT or an MRI. We know this is going to be a SPECT camera because it's got these two flat plates where the SPECT imaging takes place, and we'll explain all that. And this is a PET scanner. Uh, the outlier, of course, is the ultrasound. It looks very, very different, and we'll, we'll talk about why that is. So let's talk about CT, which is the workhorse uh, of the department. Virtually every patient at NIH ends up going through the CT department. And this is a patient with a lung cancer. And you can see the lungs uh, here and here. And there's a mass in the left lung. That's the way we always name these things. So the left is on the right side of the screen and the right is on the left part of the screen. Um, as if you are looking from the patient's foot toward their head. That's the orientation for all these scanners. And you can see uh, this dense lesion with all kinds of speculations coming off it, and that's a hallmark of tumor. But you have to understand the one thing about these images is that they're inherently digital images. They're not photographs. Um, and you can change the way uh, the image looks by twiddling the dial, specifically the so-called window and level. So the window gives you the, the grayscale. In other words, how many units of uh, grayscale they'll be spread over. So in this case, 400. Or for to see the lungs, you make that uh, window much wider, 1,500. So the whole scale is 2,000, from minus 1,000 to positive 1,000. So it's a 2,000 scale. And you can set that window. So you can see how this will be a much more contrasty window because the grayscales will be um, much more uh, close to each other. And then there's the second number, which is the level, which merely sets where the uh, middle of the grayscale is going to be. So by changing the level in the window, you can get dramatically different images. So when I'm reading a CT, for instance, I will start with this window, which we call the mediastinal window. And by the way, there is a, a nodule here that you can see. And then we will, uh, I'll switch to the lung window. These are all preset in the machine. 
and you can check out all the aspects of the lung. There's a bone window that optimizes for bone, and then there are various soft tissue um, windows that you can set up. So this is the, the grayscale that I'm talking about from black to very white. So that's the grayscale. So the question is whether you make that over the full 1,000 uh, range or 1,500 range, or whether you narrow it uh, for the mediastinal window. So CT is a wonderful technique. It's widely available. It's got minimal preparation for the patient. The only thing we ask is that they drink a radiodense contrast uh, material, which has either had a little, little iodine in it uh, or barium. And then um, the patient's brought on to the scanner. They may have had an IV uh, placed in their uh, antecubital part. And then uh, the, you, they may get contrast, they may not get contrast, but in either case, the total amount of the scan on a modern scanner is about two to three seconds. Mm -hmm. It's done. So they're extremely fast, very high resolution, and in the comparison, they're relatively inexpensive, partly because the throughput is so great that you can, you don't have to charge a lot per patient to, to make back the cost of the, the scanner. So they're relatively inexpensive. And as you can see around the world, the CT is becoming much more common. It used to be only reserved for developed world, but now the developing world commonly has access to CT. Not all parts of the developing world. Africa is a, a sad exception, but um, other parts of the world. Now, it, it doesn't, it's not without its issues. Uh, CT does require radiation, and we'll talk about that. And it often requires this intravenous contrast media, which can result in allergic reactions. They're very few, uh, but they can occur. And they can result in some kidney damage in patients who have pre-existing kidney disease. So we're very careful not to give contrast to patients who have already had kidney disease. And then fundamentally, the only thing you get out of a CT is anatomy. Now that's really important. I mean, anatomy is nine-tenths of it, but it is only anatomy. It can't tell you whether something's functioning or not, uh, whether, for instance, it's alive or dividing or uh, metastasizing. It only says that this is where it is at this point in time. So whether you get a chest X-ray or a CT scan, the fundamentals are the same in that what we what we do is we have a very high voltage circuit that essentially boils off electrons from a coil and accelerates them towards a anode, which is demarcated here. And you can see it's angled so that when it impacts this tungsten anode, uh, it'll release x-rays. So these electrons bang into the tungsten and release, uh, in the transfer of energy, release a uh, X-ray, very high energy, not very high energy, but high energy enough to penetrate through the body of a, of a patient. Now, that's the same for a chest X-ray or a CT scanner, but on a CT scanner, this X-ray tube rotates around the patient 360 degrees, and so you get this complete revolution around uh, the patient as they lie on the table. So this is called the gantry, and this is the table. So in addition to this x-ray tube, you can see this ring of detectors. So rather than use film to pick up the x-ray, we use electronic detectors that detect the energy that's being released by the x-ray, and that's converted into a little bit of light that's detected, and uh, that's recorded as a signal. Now, by itself, it's raw data. It's not an image. It has to be reconstructed to form an image. And so there are many ways of reconstruction, but just to give you the concept uh, of what's going on, um, you have, I have this drawing here. So if we have four samples in the center of uh, the gantry, and you have an x-ray source, you can see how what would happen in this direction. You'd get a lot of attenuation of the x-ray because of these two samples being lined up. 
and that would be recorded here. And then you'd get two other um, uh, attenuations of a lesser degree because of these two samples here. When you go to this position with the X-ray, you only see two. And in this one, it looks very similar to that one. And in this one, it looks very similar to that one. You can see by doing that over and over again and back projecting these, you start to resolve the four samples that you're after. And that's essentially what happens. And we do that at every slice. So you do that at this slice and then multiple slices. And you eventually get a stack, a 3D volume of what's in there. Now, it's a lot more complicated for a human body than for uh, things. And there's a lot of massaging of the data to get the images that we see. But fundamentally, that's what it is. It's a reconstruction algorithm that does that. And so if, if we look at the modern CT scanner uh, with the patient in it, there's the x-ray source that's rotating around. And by the way, this is rotating extremely fast. Um, not... Uh, Step, 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 step. It's rotating like a turbine on a jet. And in fact, it's no accident that General Electric, for instance, makes turbines in a jet and CT scanners, because it's the exact same kind of mechanical uh, device that allows it to move continuously and very fast without flying out into the room. Uh, so then there, there are all these detectors and data acquisition systems that are just sort of bolted on to the uh, gantry so that the distances aren't very great, so that you can get reconstruction times that are very fast. So virtually, as the patient's getting off the table, the entire scan is reconstructed. All that back projection that I talked about, all that computation is done in seconds, and uh, the images are created. And so... We, you know, typically we're used to looking at a CT scanner like this with the spine here and the kidneys, liver, but it's a 3D data set and it's very easy to simply reconstruct that data set in this plane. So here are the kidneys, the liver, and the spleen and all the bones. Or in the sagittal plane, and here you see the spine. And that's routine. With every single CT, you get all of that. And so you can present it in any way uh, that's optimal to see the pathology that you want to see. And in fact, we're not limited to these three planes. You can take any arbitrary plane, or sometimes we take a curved plane that, for instance, to follow the spine that does this kind of S thing, you can draw an S-shaped uh, spline and then reconstruct along that. So you can do that. So that's the beauty of a digital uh, image. Now, the, the other thing that we're always concerned about is radiation to the patient. And we know that different parts of the body will have different X-ray attenuation. And you can actually adjust the amount of radiation for that area. So as you go, for instance, the scan goes through the chest, mainly filled with air, there's much less attenuation. And so you can decrease the amount of X-rays that you're producing as you go through the lung. As you start getting into the belly, much more density, you have to boost the uh, X-ray energy uh, to accommodate. Now, one of the important things that we're working on is lowering the energy, uh, lowering the radiation dose to patients. And we've actually made dramatic, um, very dramatic changes, improvements in the amount of radiation per CT scan. Um, and a lot of it is just awareness. Um, so once uh, physicians were made aware that you could reduce the amount of radiation, um, they just uh, adjusted the, uh, you know, what they scanned, um, how much energy they used, uh, and, a, and a bunch of factors to reduce the amount of energy compared uh, or radiation comp compared to the benchmark or the baseline. And so some of the tricks we use is to lower the energy of the uh, X-ray beam, the so-called kilovoltage. Uh, we can get more sensitive detectors that don't require as much energy to detect the event. Better reconstruction algorithms can uh, decrease the amount of radiation. And we can actually create so-called synthetic images. So it's not altogether necessary, for instance, to do a scan before and after contrast, we can just take the after contrast 
and subtract out the iodine and the other things that were uh, administered, and you can get a synthetic pre-contrast image without the uh, dose involved with, with that. So that's, that's a cool thing. So this is um, the idea behind a, uh, one of these synthetic images. This is before contrast and after contrast. And you can see what happens with the contrast is there's all this brightening of the tissue, like the liver is brighter, the kidneys are brighter. You can see the cyst, which isn't changing in density, but uh, the rest of the kidney is, is brighter. Why is it brighter? Because it contains iodine, and iodine blocks the x-ray. It's a very uh, dense uh, atom, and it absorbs the x-ray. So, you, so why is it brighter? Well, we've adjusted the image so that things that attenuate more are brighter, because that's the way we think. It's completely artificial. Um, so, because uh, we want to see things enhanced, that is, get brighter with contrast, we make it that way. So that's the way it looks, and uh, it's usually administered by a pump that sits alongside the scanner, and uh, I have some pictures of that. So there's uh, one of the uh, one of the syringes has the contrast in it, and the other is a flush of saline or some kind of water that just pushes the rest of the contrast in, into the patient and flushes the system. And so the, here are the two syringes. And here's the contrast media that we use. So we use um, non-ionic iodinated contrast media. And typically, this is just one example of a formulation, but it's very typical to have this sort of benzene ring with three iodines attached to it and a bunch of other um, moieties attached to it to make it iso and iso dense or um, uh, iso osmolar with the blood. And it's very important because we actually give a huge amount of iodine, 30 to 45 grams of iodine for a CT scan. I mean, there's no, you know none of the drugs that are administered to patients are are measured in grams usually, but here. Routinely, we give uh, huge amounts of iodine. But the good news is, with normal kidneys, this is excreted very rapidly, and it's all gone within 24 hours. Patients are advised to drink, to hydrate, so that they push you know, things out with uh, good hydration. But it, you know, it's, it's, it is pretty amazing, and, and this happens every day without any ill effects. So let's go on to the next miracle of modern science, MRI. And um, so this is a completely different modality, even though at some point it, it kind of looks the same. This is a prostate MRI, which I happen to do a lot of. And uh, there's a tumor here. And here's the prostate specimen showing where the pathologist has outlined this big tumor. There are a couple other little tumors too, but the big tumor is very well uh, recapitulated on the MRI. So MRI is a, uh, has some uh, amazing advantages. It doesn't involve any radiation, or at least no ionizing radiation. It's, you can obtain it in any plane that you'd like, and it has a variety of different ways to uh, contrast the image. So you can use all these different parameters, T1 weighting, T2 weighting, diffusion, contrast enhanced, spectroscopy, and actually this is an abbreviated list. There are probably 20 other sequences that you can use to bring out specific kind of contrast in the, in the patient. So that's a huge advantage. There are some disadvantages to it. It's considerably slower than CT. So an MRI scan takes 30 minutes or 45 minutes, whereas a CT takes a, a few seconds, really. Um, it's, it tends to be more expensive. It doesn't do very well with calcification, so if that's important, but this is not the uh, modality. And then there are some significant safety issues that um, have to become built into your system so that you don't have catastrophes, because this is actually a very, very strong magnet in the MRI. It's, it's hundredfold stronger than the, or a thousandfold stronger than 
the Earth's magnetic field. And so ordinary objects like scissors or oxygen tanks uh, become projectiles in an MRI sweep. And they can accelerate into the scanner. And if somebody's in there, they can cause a lot of damage. People have been killed uh, in this way. So we, have, we work very hard to maintain a safe environment in which we don't allow those kind of metallic projectiles to come anywhere close to the MRI. We have people who are highly trained to make sure anybody who enters the room has been pre-screened for any kind of um, uh, uh, you know, potential projectiles. And there's just a, an awareness and alertness that has to be surround an MR scanner. MR scanner, even though the lights are out, it's in the middle of the night, the MRI, the magnet, is still on. And so that's one of the gospels that we talk about. The, the magnet is always on, 24-7. So, you know, even when the, uh, the guys come to polish the floor with their polishing machines, no. <laughs> Just because the lights are out, there's nobody home, that, that polishing machine will get swept into the magnet and uh, damage the magnet and uh, damage the polishing machines. Then there's some metallic implanting devices in patients, such as pacemaker and cochlear implants, that will be ruined by the high magnetic field. So you don't want to bring patients with those in. Um, now, increasingly, pacemakers are MR compatible. Even some cochlear implants are MR compatible. So it can be done, but you need to really look into what the um, patient has inside their body. So let's do a little uh, physics of how this all works. It's sort of magic. Uh, how does a magnetic field create an image that you can use and diagnose in medicine? So if you take uh, protons, you know, most of which are uh, involved with water molecules, H2O, each H is a proton, they're randomly distributed in space. There's no particular order to them. But then you apply a magnetic field, and that, like soldiers, they'll come to attention and align either with or uh, against the magnetic field. Slightly more with than against, but still there's a balance. And some very smart physicists understood or discovered that if you take these little soldiers that are aligned with the magnetic field and apply a radio frequency, radio frequency wave, that is like radio, uh, at a specific frequency, you can get these uh, spins to deviate from their alignment with the magnetic field temporarily. You can get them to point in another direction. And when you turn off the RF, they relax back to the native state. And when they do that, if you have a radio frequency coil, you can detect the signal that's occurring as it relaxes back. Well, that is pretty cool. And it works. So the modern magnetic MRI uh, aligns all these protons and then applies an RF pulse which deviates the uh, spins into, say, another plane. And that's called, if it goes into this plane, 90 degree pulse. Or if it goes all the way uh, in the opposite direction, that's 180 degree pulse. And so you can design these very cool pulses that are either 180 or 90, as you can see. And then you apply, and this is the real magic, gradient, magnetic gradients at the same time over the patient so that each site in the body has its own unique radio frequency resonance frequency. That way you can resolve where you are because you know at, at uh, this location only these spins will be uh, giving you signal. At this location only these spins. Um, and so painstakingly you can work through that whole thing and generate enough signal to create an image. And again, um, it's a little more complicated. Um, I noticed someone who actually knows something about this in the room, so I'm, I'm hesitant to go into too much detail. But 
uh, suffice it to say that you can take these signals and sort of back project them in a way and recreate the, uh, uh, you know, what's in the center of the, of the magnet. And you do this iteratively over and over again, and eventually you get a very nice image. So what are some of the details or looking under the hood of an MRI? So like all these scanners, there's a gantry, and the patient obviously is, is lying in here. Now, if you've ever had an MRI, you hear this, this clunking noise. It's very loud. And that is because of the movement of these gradient coils um, in, um, as the gradients are applied. They move a little bit. And the movement causes a big clunk that you, you hear. That's why we have to use ear protection uh, for the patients who are in there. So uh, um, we put you know, headphones over and also um, do a number of things to try to protect the ears. So one of the key things to getting the magnetic field at, up to the high levels that we needed to get is to have superconducting wire which is in a bed of liquid helium. So it's soaking in liquid helium or there's a, there's a packaging around it of liquid helium. And when you bring uh, wires down to that temperature, you can apply a um, electrical current and it'll just continue and continue and continue. No resistance. So you charge up the magnet and you really don't have to power it up or add more power. Um, unless you start running out of liquid helium. So that makes it very efficient in terms of usage of power. If you were trying to achieve these high magnetic fields with just like a resistive magnet, like a regular electromagnet, you'd have, you'd have to get a power plant of the size of one that, that takes care of Bethesda to do one, one MRI. But rather, this becomes much more efficient. You charge it up. It does take a lot of energy to charge up, but you charge it, and then you just keep it going with the uh, superconducting uh, magnet. Now, one of the that creates a little bit of a danger because if something goes wrong, like there's a short in the wire, or something else happens, there's a boil off of the liquid helium. All this energy uh, is converted into heat very rapidly, and the heat takes this liquid helium and turns it into gaseous helium right away. You know, liquid helium is a very, very low temperature. And so if you start generating heat, it turns it from liquid to gas. And that gas has to go somewhere. And so if you don't vent the scanner out to the outside, all that helium gas is going to fill up the room where the MRI is and it's going to displace the oxygen. And they learned this the hard way, that patients won't be able to breathe. So you have to quickly vent that, any escaped gas outside the room, outside the building. So you always see, when you look at an MRI, um, this bit that's connected to the ceiling. And that's the so-called quench pipe, where in the event of a catastrophe, the gas will be vented out of the room and not into the patient. So there's also a, the, an injector, just like we have with CT. It looks very similar. It operates in a very similar way. And there's the ear protection device that I talked about. So just a word about safety. Um, so ordinary objects like keys and scissors and any kind of uh, tools can be rapidly sucked into the magnet. So we've designed these uh, rooms so there's so-called different zones where the dressing room, you don't have to be uh, very concerned about it because you're not very close to the magnet. But as you enter the, um, the next zone, zone three, the control room, you're about to go into the scanner. There is a process in place whereby you're checked for any of these kinds of objects your history is taken, and uh, it's made clear that you're safe to go in. And then zone four is actually where the magnet is. So there's actually a design, a purposeful design to make sure it, this is safe. Um, so from early days of MR, uh, there's our buffer. 
uh, where it shouldn't be. And here's a cabinet. And these are very, very painful experiences, I can tell you, because uh, the, the magnet is very damaged. Uh, it takes a lot of work to, to remove these things. And uh, it's expensive and just to be avoided. So here's an oxygen tank that's been sucked into the magnet. You can imagine if there was somebody's head right there, this could have been a catastrophe. It's an airborne torpedo. So these warnings are very, very serious, and we, we take them very seriously. So like um, uh, CT, we also use contrast media for MRI. And you can light up uh, like this tumor here using gadolinium contrast agent. So gadolinium is a paramagnetic substance that uh, in a magnetic field will influence the spins of adjacent, adjacent spins. So you'll, you have these different types of gadolinium compounds, like these linear compounds and these cyclic compounds that uh, capture the gadolinium and keep them in this chelate. Some are more stable than others. So if we just look at the uh, thermodynamic stability constant, so this is an exponential term. Um, so in other words, when I say this one is 22 and this is 25, I mean it's approximately a thousand times more stable. Uh, so there are agents that are extremely stable. Uh, the top of the, the heap here is ghetto teratate or gato, uh, gadolinium uh, dota uh, or dotarem, which is what we use. And it's very stable. Here's one that's quite good. Um, and then they get lower and lower. And uh, some of them are really multiple orders of magnitude lower in uh, thermodynamic stability. And that means that the gadolinium, which should be captured in the molecule, becomes loose. Gadolinium is an extremely toxic um, atom. And in patients who have very poor renal clearance, you can get a syndrome called nephrogenic systemic sclerosis, wherein there's deposition of the gadolinium in the soft tissues, and that leads to a severe fibrosis, so that in this case, it's very difficult for the patient to uh, bend their fingers or bend their knee. And, uh, it, it can be a fatal uh, illness. Fortunately, if you don't give gadolinium to patients with renal failure or very poor renal function, you can avoid this uh, disease. And since its discovery in 2007, uh, its recognition, the number of cases has dropped, plummeted dramatically. So the gadolinium molecule is very, is highly toxic, but Patients with normal renal function excrete the gadolinium chelates very rapidly, certainly within 24 to 48 hours. It's really patients with abnormal renal function that may take weeks to excrete the agent. And during that time, some of the uh, less secure gadolinium chelates will allow dissociation of the gadolinium, which can then deposit in soft tissues. And that can lead to fibrosis. Uh, so the risk factors are renal failure, the, how much dose you're giving, clearly, which agent you're giving. Um, the more stable ones, the better. And always, it's important to consider alternate, alternative imaging for those kinds of patients. Because um, it might be that a CT will do just as well, or a PET scan, or even a non-contrast MRI will answer the question. So you don't need to put the patient at risk. Now, recently, there's been a lot of uh, concern across the world about an observation that's being made that patients who receive uh, gadolinium, especially multiple doses, start to show accumulation of it in parts of the brain. Now, it's not associated yet with any known um, symptoms or signs or premature death or anything, but there is this sort of uh, concerning, I would say, um, deposition of, of gadolinium, presumably free gadolinium, but it's not clear, in parts of the brain. And so the European regulatory agency has actually started to ban 
some of these lower um, thermodynamic, less stable compounds and only permitting these higher stable compounds. The US FDA has looked at the same da data and said, well, it's true that it's depositing, but we can't s show any harm from that yet. So they're not putting any restrictions on any of these agents. Uh, we've made our own decision that we're going to use the most stable gadolinium chelate there is and, um, and try to decrease the amount of depositions. So let's move on to ultrasound, which is always the funnest modality because you can stay in the room. There are no projectiles. There's nothing dangerous. It's very safe, and it's usually done uh, in, in happy circumstances like uh, obstetrical uh, imaging. Uh, so it's no radiation. It's real time, which is uh, uh, unbelievable. You can just pick up the probe, the ultrasound probe, put it on the patient, and see images right away. No processing, no reconstruction. Uh, very inexpensive. It's certainly the most common modality across the world. No prep, no injection. What, what, what's not to like about ultrasound? So there are some problems with it. First of all, it really matters who's holding the probe. You need to be a skilled user. You can't be an amateur and get decent images. And the other thing is that it's almost like a flashlight where you where you put the beam, you'll see something. If you don't put the beam in a certain area, you won't see it. So you have to have sort of completeness of scanning in order to make sure that you cover everything. So what you see is all there is. If you don't scan the pathology, you won't see the pathology. Unlike CT, you get everything. So it's very difficult to quantify. We can measure on MRI, we can measure on CT, but ultrasound's very difficult to measure. And then there are parts of the body that just won't transmit sound. So air doesn't transmit sound. So the lungs, you can't see anything. Bones, the sound just bounces off bones. Can't see anything. The brain, because it's surrounded by bone, you can't see anything. Now, in the operating room, when the skull is open, you can get an ultrasound probe and see all kinds of things in the brain. But uh, through the, the hair and the bone, you really can't see anything. So this is really pretty simple. Uh, the, the principle of ultrasound is you send out an, uh, a high frequency um, shock wave, sound wave. That's what a sound wave is. It's a series of shocks. This is at, say, 5 megahertz, million cycles per second. So it's really moving fast. And you send those out, and they'll hit an object, and that'll reflect back. And if you're smart, like the, the people who built these scanners, you know that in tissue, sound has a specific speed. So if you send out a pulse, and you wait, and it, you count how much time it takes to hear back, you know how deep that thing is right away, because it's, you can tell by the, uh, the travel time. So you can start to localize things by how, um, how long it takes to get the sound back. So sound can do a bunch of things in the body. It can be completely attenuated. So for instance, if this is the skin and you send out an ultrasound beam and you encounter air in the lung, boom, stop. That's all you're going to see. And so that's attenuation. Then there's absorption, which is the normal thing. So as you go deeper in uh, the tissue, there's absorption of the sound. So the signal gets less and less and less. But the engineers are very smart. They know that. So they know that the longer distance you need to travel with the sound, you need to amplify it a little bit. The deeper, you amplify more. So this is called a, a time gain setting. The longer the time, the more the gain. So you can correct for that. Then there's reflection. That's pretty obvious. Something that's uh, like a stone will be very reflective because it's a big impedance mismatch between the tissue and the stone. And so it'll just take the, that, that wave and send it back. It can scatter the sound in different directions. Um, it can refract like light, and it can diffract. 
And that's where you get some really strange artifacts that uh, ultrasound guys love to show. But you can do a lot with uh, ultrasound. So this is, a, this is a patient who has lots of spots in their liver. Unfortunately, it's metastatic disease, but you can really very instantly uh, tell what's going on there. So there's a little magic to these probes. Um, in fact, uh, I don't have a slide of it, but they've actually gone to wireless probes now, so you don't even have wires. But there's a piezoelectric crystal in this thing that, uh, to which you apply a high-frequency uh, current, and that'll cause that uh, crystal to vibrate, and that vibration gets sent forth through, um, here's the piezoelectric, and then it gets sent forth into the tissue. And you can have different frequencies, different shapes, even intracavitary probes, um, depending on what the need is. Now, one of the cool things that's happening is this is our standard in-hospital scanner. They're, they're gorgeous devices. It's amazing what you can see with them. But miniaturization is, is happening, and this is an, uh, a scan, scanner that we have uh, called the Sonosite, which is basically a laptop uh, with the probe. And then, of course, everything gets connected to a phone. So it's their phone-sized ultrasound devices now. So it's very uh, incredible. One of the great things, of course, about ultrasound is the real-time aspect, and that becomes very important when you're trying to do a procedure like a biopsy. So you can use the ultrasound, get real-time images, and actually watch the needle go into the thing you're trying to biopsy. So that, that's much better than CT, where you'd have to put the needle in, scan, see where it is, move the needle some more, scan, see where it is. Um, this is real time, so it, it's a very advantageous. And then the last thing I want to talk, talk about ultrasound is a contrast agent, uh, which is very different from the other contrast agents I've been talking about, which are really small molecules. These are giant molecules, really. They're, they're bubbles filled with gas, and because they're filled with gas, they reflect a lot. Um, you know, just like I said, air reflects a lot this gas reflects a lot, and it actually causes reverberations of the sound that you can pick up. You can actually crush these, um, these microbubbles and release whatever's in them. So people are using that for drug delivery. So you can see the microbubble get into the organ that you want, and then you increase the power, and you crush the bubble, and all the drug comes out right where, where you want it. So that's a new technology. So in the last uh, few minutes, what I want to move on to are, is a field called nuclear medicine, which is allied with CT, MRI, and ultrasound. Uh, but it, it's fundamentally different in that it involves the injection of a radioactive substance into uh, the body, small amounts. So let's just do some basics of um, atomic particles. Um, the, the biggest one that's emitted from a nucleus is an alpha particle, which is a helium nucleus. Uh, and that's a pretty big bowling ball. It has a lot of energy, but it doesn't get very far. In fact, a sheet of paper will block an alpha particle. So it's not really that useful for imaging, because it's not going to get anywhere. A beta particle, which is an electron, a charged electron, um, can get through a, a little bit deeper. But it is also has limitations to uh, the sort of millimeter uh, range. And then there's the gamma ray, which is the cousin of the X-ray. Very high energy. It's a photon. It doesn't really have mass, per se, although Einstein would yell at me for that. Um, and so it actually penetrates very far. So we're going to be talking about um, radioactive materials that release gamma rays, so-called single photon emissions. So, and then we're going to capture that on what looks pretty much like a CT, but it's a little bit different. So we'll talk about that. So the advantage of a SPECT scanner is that it's 
the agents are relatively inexpensive. It's, it's a technology that's been around for many, many years, but it does involve radiation. There's preparation of this imaging agent. There are a lot of nuclear regulatory uh, issues, and the scanning is extremely slow. It can take an hour to scan a patient, and the resolution is even worse um, at six to seven millimeters uh, resolution. And what goes on is that you have a source of gamma rays. Let's say this is in the body. There's something that you've injected, a radionuclide like a technetium MDP, which is a bone scanning agent. Um, and it emits in every single direction there is. You know, it doesn't know where the scanner is. It just emits gamma rays willy-nilly into the environment. Well, if you're going to try to get an image of that, you need to corral these gamma rays in a certain way so you have some idea where they're coming from. And the way you do that is with something called a collimator. And a collimator is kind of what it sounds like. It, it, column, it puts into columns these gamma rays so that they're forced to go through these holes. If they don't go through those holes, you don't see them. So they're rejected in the terminology. And then the only the ones that get through are allowed to hit this crystal, which scintillates, I mean, produces a little light, and that light is detected by these detectors. So that's the way it all, it all works. But you can see, because of this collimator, you're rejecting a lot of the radioactivity. So the patient is getting all this radioactivity, but only a tiny percent of it, less than 1% of it, is captured for imaging. Um, so this is a picture of a collimator, and you can see it's usually made out of some very dense material like tungsten, and the gamma ray has to make it right down the center of that thing, otherwise it's going to get rejected. If it comes in at the side, it'll get rejected. So it makes it uh, relatively inefficient. So we, um, we, for in this case, we have a technetium methyl diphosphonate, which goes to bones, and then also to bony lesions that are um, turning over or growing. So here's a positive bone scan with multiple metastatic lesions. And this agent, 99M technetium, has a six-hour half-life, which means every six hours it decreases in activity by half. So by 24 hours, it's negligible amount of activity. So you basically have only a few hours to scan the patient after you've um, uh, injected them. So there are a bunch of agents that are available for specific uh, uses, like for thyroid and salivary gland imaging. We use something called pertechnetate to look at the parathyroid gland. We use thallium. We can use indium for uh, white cell labeling. I-131 for thyroid scan. This is a thyroid scan. So different uh, agents for different parts of the body. And of course, what we can now add, in addition to the single photon capture, which is this part of the device, you can add a conventional CT so you can get both, uh, both images and superimpose them on each other. So here's a patient with uh, head and neck cancer, and they have nodes that are lighting up and you can see that superimposed on the CT scan that's obtained at the same time. That's called hybrid imaging, two different kinds of techniques into, into one. So the last uh, topic is positron emission tomography, which is uh, probably the coolest uh, part of the department. So positrons are actually positive electrons. They're in the general class of antimatter which actually exists. <laughs> and um, positrons are emitted by specific kinds of radioactive materials. They come out, and then they meet an electron, and an event happens called an annihilation. So matter meets antimatter and turns into energy in a very specific way. Two gamma rays of 511 keV each are ejected in opposite directions. And that makes all the difference in the world compared to SPECT. Because SPECT, remember, the, the events are happening in random directions. In PET, they're happening in a very prescribed way, opposite directions to each other. So if you see an event here, 
and an event here at the same time, you know that somewhere along that line, there's, there's an event that happened. There's a radioactive uh, decay that occurred. And if you do that enough, you collect that enough, you can compose an image with much better resolution than the spec, but very highly sensitive. So you can get highly sensitive scan, you can get metabolic information uh, because uh, you can actually see agents that are taken up uh, in specific metabolic situations. The spatial resolution is improved and it is also combined with CT, that hybrid um, approach. It's expensive, it has the same regulatory issues and the half-life is short, so you gotta get on it. So just to review, this uh, one of our workhorse isotopes for PET, F18, emits a positive electron or a positron, and it goes some distance, which is governed by the energy of the positron, away from the nucleus, and then it meets an electron, annihilates, and two gamma rays are uh, emitted opposite each other at 511 KeV, very precise, it's always the same amount of energy. No matter what the isotope is, the energy is always 511 KeV. So that's kind of neat. And so you can get much better, better spatial resolution, but the most important thing is the sensitivity is in the picomolar, nanomolar range for things. Now, in the 1920s, this very smart guy, Otto Warburg, figured out that cancers make some kind of switch that starts to use, instead of uh, glucose in an aerobic way, uses it, uses it anaerobically. And because it's much less efficient than, um, glucose uptake is much less efficient when you do it anaerobically, you need a lot more glucose. So tumors become extremely avid for glucose. Now, fast forward um, about 30 years, 40 years, and a scientist here at the NIH, Lou Sokoloff, had the idea of making an artificial glucose, uh, fluorodeoxyglucose. And um, he showed that the body would treat that very much like uh, glucose, um, but would, uh, would trap it in the cell rather than continuing to process it as it would with glucose. Now, um, he didn't see the full potential of that, but that idea led to the development of F18 FDG, um, which was a labeled version of it that we could detect and therefore look at metabolism with a PET scan. So here, for instance, is a, a PET scan that uses FDG. And I want to point out a few things um, about this. So basically what's going on is the FDG is incorporated into the cell, it's phosphorylated, but it's trapped inside the cell, so it can't get out. So here it is, the molecule coming into the cell through the glute transporter, but trapped in the cell, so it accumulates. So where does it accumulate? Well, it accumulates in the brain, it accumulates in the heart, it accumulates in the kidney because it's excreted by the kidney because it's not really glucose. You know, regular glucose isn't excreted very much in the kidney. But this is fake glucose. And so the kidney, miraculously to me, is able to identify it as fake. And it says, oh, I'm going to excrete you. So it excretes it into the bladder, as you can see here. This is a male. The testicles are lighting up. Why? They're metabolic the uh, liver and spleen, pretty metabolic. And this, these are the tonsils um, around the, the, the ring of Waldire. And uh, you can see they're fairly active. And so maybe he has a cold or something um, that's activating that. So you can see all these things, and of course tumors show up as well. So here's a tumor, a patient with uh, metastases, and here, for instance, is uptake in the uh, sinuses, uptake in a rib, uptake in the iliac bone. And you can correlate that with uh, the bones. The bones look very abnormal in this situation. Uh, and here's another example. This is a patient with breast cancer. And you can see the CT scan shows a lot of abnormalities. There's this 
big thing occupying most of the uh, cavity. But if you look at the PET CT, it tells you that this is a tumor, this is a tumor, and this is just fluid. There's nothing metabolically go active going on there. On the other hand, when you look at this sagittal view, you can see some of the vertebral bodies are active. So that's metastases there. So it's an extremely powerful technique uh, that enables you to see uh, all kinds of things. And that's just FDG. There's a huge amount of chemistry that's available to look at specific things. And my lab is very interested in, in these things. So one of them is sodium fluoride that picks up in the bone. Uh, fluorothymidine, thymidine is a, a nucleoside. So you can measure cellular proliferation the division of cells, estradiol, so look at estrogen receptor, fluoroquine, mem uh, membrane turnover, fluoromyzo for hypoxia. One that's very interesting is fluorobetabin, uh, which is used for uh, amyloid detection in Alzheimer's disease. You can label antibodies uh, like Herceptin, and you can, we're, we're currently labeling cells and injecting them to see where the cells go in the in the patient. So all kinds of things that you can do with this uh, agent, with this modality. So PET has the advantages of high energy photon imaging, high sensitivity, and the ability to correct for uh, attenuation. No need for collimation, so it's much more efficient. And um, even with all that, the resolution is no great shakes. It's still in the order of three to four millimeters, but it's, it's much better. So let's just go over sort of a comparison of these modalities that I've talked about for the last 50 minutes. So we have um, these modalities in the order that I discussed them. Let's talk about resolution. Well, in terms of the sharpest resolution, CT is at the top of the heap. It has submillimeter resolution. MRI can approach it, but not quite. Ultrasound is a little bit better. PET is better than SPEC. SPEC is the worst. Okay, so if it's resolution you're after, can you, that is, can you define two very close structures to each other? CT is the best modality. How about sensitivity? You're trying to pick up something in the body. So by far, the highest sensitivity by multiple orders of magnitude is PET. And by about an order of magnitude, SPECT is behind it. And then it gets kind of, uh, kind of gross. There's a reason why you have to inject 40 grams of iodine to see something. It's because it's not that sensitive for the detection of iodine. So you really have to put in a boatload. And if you were trying to measure a receptor, for instance, with 40 grams, you'd saturate everything around. You, I mean, you'd, you'd saturate the receptor and everything else. You wouldn't see what you're looking for. But with a PET scanner at the nanomolar concentration that you can detect, you can actually start to look at detectors like the estrogen receptor on a tumor and uh, differentiate it from tissues that don't have the estrogen receptor. Okay, so everything has its problems. And so now what about cost? Well, ultrasound is definitely the most efficient from a cost or effective. Uh, and that's why it's, it's used uh, routinely. Uh, a, f a friend of mine who, um, retired, decided that one of the most useful things he could do would be to fund a school in Africa that teaches how to use ultrasound, but also how to repair ultrasound devices. Because they're, you know, the nearest repair guys in parts of Africa are in Europe. So he, he with his own money, he made this school that did that. On, he won all kinds of prizes for doing it. But he did it because he thought this was the most meaningful way he could um, leave a legacy in his field. And it, there's no doubt that that's true. But CT is coming down significantly in price, and we're seeing more and more of it. Of course, it demands good power, um, you know, a healthy power supply, not one that wobbles all over the place. And it, it requires skilled repair, and uh, especially the way we do things now, where Nobody really diagnoses anything. They do it remotely and then send you a board to, you know, to put in. Um, then SPEC, MRI, and PET is the, is the most expensive. So uh, what I hope I've done is um, 
sort of given you an overview of what a modern radiology department is about and um, you know made the point that the workhorse for oncology is CT but for many specialty cancers MRI is used the most ultrasound is used for biopsies and for problem solving uh, spect is used for bone meta metastasis and uh, PET CT is used for you know determining metabolic activity and things like that so that's what I wanted to say, here's my email and our website if you're interested. And I'll be happy to answer any questions that you might have. What would be the best way for early detection? Well, let's, uh, let's narrow that question down. Uh, let's say best way for early detecting of lung cancer. So there's actually a trial that was conducted uh, using CT, low-dose CT scans. And um, in smokers older than age 50 who had a significant smoking history, uh, I think it was 20 pack years or something like that. Uh, and using those criteria, the CT was able to detect stage one cancers uh, in sufficiently high numbers that they closed the study multiple years early because it was unfair to the control group that didn't have CT. Uh, so now that's a routine uh, test for smokers of a certain age who have a certain um, exposure history. Um, but you'll see around uh, companies that will, in my view, sort of uh, play on patients' fears or normal people's fears, not patients, uh, to screen for cancer. Um, there's nothing wrong with you. You don't have a risk factor of any sort, but you're, you're worried. And there's this inescapable uh, logic that they use, which is, well, if we find it early, then we can save you. And there's, you know, everybody buys that logic. It's not totally true, first of all, but more problematic than that is that you, these scanners pick up all kinds of stuff, good stuff, bad stuff. The trouble is you, you can't tell what's what, so you, there's a nodule in the lung. Well, it could be cancer, it may not be cancer, now we need to put a needle into your lung. So there's a very, uh, there's a very telling case report from the chairman of radiology at Emory who uh, underwent something called a virtual colonography, which is, you know, to avoid colonoscopy, get a CT scan. Okay, so they discovered something in his liver. All right, he's, you know, he should really have a biopsy. He has a biopsy of that, and that's nothing. Don't worry about it. But during that biopsy, they see that there's a little lung nodule. So they say, look, you know, we... I don't know what to say, but it could be cancer. You should have it out. And so, but we have this way of just sticking a little scope in there and just taking it out, no big deal. He says, okay, let's do that. Does that, it's benign. But he has rib pain for the next six months that prevents him from working. And so, <laughs> if you play back the story, he actually was a healthy guy, uh, but he underwent all these procedures for no reason. So. There's a there's real danger to just screening the general population um, with these imaging techniques. That's the lesson. All right, thank you very much.